Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman. I know I say this every week about how excited I am that a guest is here, but this man, this man, I was trying to figure out how long we have known each other, and I have told him many times over the course of our relationship that he is my favorite chef in New York, (laughs) and uh, he never quite believes me, but it continues to be true. Uh, Welcome, Marco Canora from Hearth Restaurant of of. Roto and uh, just a mil- and uh, one of my most stained cookbooks. Nice salt to taste. Salt to taste. It's a mm. lovely thing. Thank you, Kat. That's so nice. It is. Uh, I was trying to figure out how long we've known each other. What year did Hearth open? Two thousand three. Okay, I probably started coming there within a year or so mm. of of it opening, and I want to apologize to you on air for not having been for <laughs> a, while. a while. Yeah. But okay. um, as you know, I you know I've and we're going to talk about this, I have a, a lot of gut stuff that has made it really painful to go out to restaurants. Um, for people who are just listening to this and not seeing it, I have this fantastic warm cup of, of Brodo, which is mm-hmm. broth, yes, that is. he has uh, started He started selling it out of the window of Hearth way back when. And um, you're telling me this is, this is going to help. It's very good for the gut, yeah. without question. So how is it that you started um, making this, this broth? Um, well... As a professional chef, you use broth. It's pretty <laughs> essential, I like to say. Salt, pepper, water, fat, and broth. And sofrito are basically the core of everything. I've made your sofrito from the aforementioned cookbook yeah. a gazillion times. It adds so much flavor. Could you explain what it is? Sure. It's uh, Well, what's cool about it, like broth, it's like every corner of the globe has a sofrito. Every corner of the globe has broth. These are like the traditional foods of cooking. Um, and it's base. It's usually high sugar content uh, root vegetables, <laughs> high sugar content root vegetables. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case of salt to taste, and what we use at Hearth, it's red onion, carrot, and celery. Mm-hmm. And you mince them until they're very small, and then you fry them in fat until all the water comes out. And then it begins to color the way sugar begins to color, because there's a lot of natural sugar. So you could do a very very blonde sofrito or you could do a seriously, seriously dark sofrito. And depending on what time of year, you kind of play with that lightness or darkness. So if you're going to do like a wild boar ragu Mm. in the dead of winter, you're going to take that sofrito super, super, super dark. Um, And if it's summer and you're going to do like a Tuscan-style fish stew, you'll probably do it on the much lighter side. So uh, it's in your ribolita, is it not? Um, the ribolita has the ingredients, but it's not minced. Okay. It's just diced and then sweated. Okay. That ribolita, I remember when Superstorm Sandy mm. hit New York City and power was knocked out of yeah. a lot of neighborhoods. In particular, I believe Red Hook was really hard hit in some of the, some of the places like the beach communities. And I was reporting for CNN at mm-hmm. the time, and I remember I went out there, and you had set up shop just making ribolita for, for people. Yeah. And because as I, <laughs> I, I believe, you, you've said it can cure anything. It's, it's like a multivitamin as food, for sure. And it's very soothing to the soul. Um, I actually tried to create a like 501c3 around that whole food flood thing because we we're like, what can I do to help? Because it was so, it was a it was a big deal. I mean, we were yeah. closed for five days. People were freaking out, and like, our restaurant wanted to help the community. And I have this massive size pot that I do stocks in, so I was like, let's just make ribolita, and then just give it to anybody who wants it. Yeah, and that's what we did, and it was awesome. We got these like turkey, uh, the deep frying turkey kits with the propane. And we just would go places and like put a big pot of ribolita on a, <laughs> on a turkey fryer rig and just like hand out hot soup to people. And it was, it was awesome. It really does something for the it soul. It was fun. Well, and I remember also I had totally- Food flood, I think we called food it. Flood, yeah. And I, I, I just remembered this. I had totally forgotten this, that after the storm, um, it, it was really important that people- 
you know, who can went back in, to support restaurants. And yeah. because the thing is, it's not just front of house. It's like, you know, a dishwasher isn't getting paid, a, you know, a, a prep cook, a, you know, get people, people were uh, missing out on their livelihoods. And even when restaurants were up and running again, and I remember I had Anthony Bourdain actually wrote a really incredible um, essay for us at, at CNN about why you should, why you should go out to restaurants. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember I very publicly uh, walked to Hearth from, uh, from my home in Brooklyn and took taking pictures <laughs> of restaurants along the way to yeah. say like, Hey, they're open, go and eat there. They're open, go and eat there. And I finished, it's not a short walk from my house yeah, in Brooklyn no to doubt. the East Village, but I walked over the bridge and stuff because I, I really, that's where I wanted to be. Was, that's was so at sweet. Well, I, that I, opening night was such a special evening. It was packed. Yeah. It was really great. But it, it really, I think it speaks to the kind of cooking that you do that after this, you know, this storm that really impacted people's lives and continues to today, there are still people who have gotten their insurance payouts, some mm. places that had permanent damage that had to close, but everybody wanted to be in that dining room because they knew that they would be fed the food that just sustains their soul. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, look, the the best compliment we can get at Hearth is when people say it's soulful food mm-hmm. and it reminds me of grandma and it's always delicious and like... That's exactly who I want to be. That's exactly what I strive for. And, you know, there was a time in my career where I was a little perfection obsessed. <laughs> I've heard even, that. Even yeah. with, you know, even with the the simple soulful approach, you can get obsessed with the perfection mm-hmm. of executing that vision. Um, so, but that, that's certainly not where I'm at today. Yeah. Uh, and like soulful deliciousness uh, wrapped in like a, a blanket of joy is like the perfect kind of scenario in my mind. I've known you long enough that I have seen a profound change. In you. <laughs> yeah. you are a super cranky guy. <laughs> when, oh my god! When I met you, it you has had been quite a ride. Long hair and sort of I, I would I, I would go to hearth and every once in a while you'd sort of surface out of the back <laughs> and, and look angry that you had been dragged out of your hole. Yeah, true. And uh, and you know and I. I heard you described as a yeller and all this stuff. not not pretty. But I remember, though, you were on um, Next Iron Chef yeah. with my friend Brian Caswell. And yeah. we we yeah. were eating at uh, one of your places nearby and decided to, to come by. And you had changed. You'd cut your hair. You all of a sudden were standing up straight, like light in your eyes yeah. in a way that I had not seen in the years that I had known you. So you've gone through a pretty profound change. Can we talk about that? Sure. I would love to. Um, and well, actually, you know, the only thing, you know what I'll say, I would love to, but it's such a common refrain. Like I've listened to a bunch of these podcasts yeah. and it's like, and so, so many chefs of late have come out with their stories and, mm-hmm. And, you know, they're all very similar. So mm-hmm. I, I'm a little bit self-conscious about talking about it yeah. because I feel like it's just so uh, – everybody's heard the story before. So I feel like I'm just going to tell the same story. I'm going to tell and you. And it's like the drinking and the and the not eating well and the abusiveness and all of the things that mm-hmm. I think – I think I've listened to three or four of these podcasts. And I really love them, by the way, and congratulations. <laughs> You're doing an amazing job. Um but it's like, yeah, like we all of a certain generation, I think mm-hmm. you made a reference to the Gen Xers. The Gen X masochist chefs. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> like, hello, like there I am there. Yeah. I'm like deep in it. Uh, I'll, I'll say though, the reason that for me it's, it's different to talk to you is because you changed deeply and fundamentally the way you cook and your entire restaurant. You over this is why I wanted to talk about this with you in particular, mm. because you uh, texted me or called me or something and said, "Hey, I want to talk to you about something." Yeah, and we went and and met up. Uh, I was coming out of therapy, right, right that yeah. particular At day. Old and town. I, yeah, and I was in a pretty emotional state. Um, and we sat down, and you said, "I'm going to completely change." my restaurant and the menu Mm -hmm. and the way the food is presented. And really you asked me if I thought you were crazy for doing this because the food that I had, you know, known and come to love at hearth is, you know, this, this soulful, but like sort of heavy kind of things like big long braises and God, that gnocchi. And serious plating and multiple pot pickups. And it was very ambitious and very challenging. Yeah. But you, but simple. Yeah. At the same time. But I remember 
you really internalize this change because like, yes, there are absolutely, you know, a bunch of chefs who, you know, I mention in the same breath on a regular basis and who have, you know, put, you know, books out and things. The way you overhauled Hearth, you closed for a while Mm -hmm. to change everything. And that was a huge risk that you took. So let's talk about that. Sure. Um, you know, part of it was separating with my uh, business partner. So I was with Paul Greco for the first 10 years. And like, you know, I grew up, <laughs> I grew up like a Gramercy Tavern, like in the first five, six years of the existence. And like, as you know, the dining world of that time period is very, very different than mm-hmm. today. And it's like... That lineup, it was you, Tom Colicchio, like who, who uh, all Which was, lineup? Oh, sorry, at Gramercy, who yeah. all was there? Uh, Jonathan Benno, Octar, Damon Wise, Tom, um, Stephen Solomon. Stephen Solomon. <laughs> For yes. people who don't know, he's oh a captain God. there, and he is a he magical is, human he is being. A beast. <laughs> speed pace. Ro- uh, p- speed pace robot. Speed pace robot. But I mean, I it, love his if stuff. If you look at that kitchen at that time, that is an intense. It was a beast. Claudia lineup. Fleming was in there. Oh, Claudia Fleming. She um, needs to get her due. It was amazing. Nicholas Morgenstern came shortly after I left. Um, But anyway, I guess my point is it's like, you know, if you asked me to define what success was during that time Mm -hmm. period and what it looked like to have a fine dining restaurant and all that stuff, it's like it couldn't be further from what the world wants today. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. Tweezery and – Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like – and also like, you know, Rene Redzepi kind of changed the face of this. But this notion like luxury everywhere in the world was the same. Mm Mm-hmm. It was lobster. It was langoustine. It was foie gras. It was caviar. It was all cream. Of, yeah, it was spot prawns, and it was all these like there was like a couple dozen things that were items of luxury and fine it dining. Late, like nineteen sixties, would you say? Yeah, like, isn't it weird? And like now, it's like all that stuff is gone. Um, oh no, it still reigns supreme in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, does it really? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's for funny me, to, it's in, funny to see it when this, it pops up. But. In this little bubble island that mm-hmm. I exist on in Manhattan, um, you know, it's not really that relevant anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it hurts to eat that way. I mean, I think a lot of us are reckoning with our, our bodies yeah. and having eaten that food for a long time. Like I, Too many calories. I, I went to a restaurant for a friend's birthday celebration, a very, <clears throat> very high-end, well-regarded restaurant that is probably, you know, one of the fanciest in Manhattan's and, and like has this rep for a reason. It's luxurious, beautiful and stuff. I wanted to die the next day. Yeah. I felt so physically terrible and I even had kept it what I thought was light but some of it was inescapable and I hate that I hate going out to a meal and feeling like I had to pay for it with my my body later 100% agree which was a big impetus behind why I wanted to change our approach at hearth and like I wanted to like serve uh, you know I always kind of distilled it down to this it's like I want people to come into my restaurant have a really wonderful meal and a wonderful experience with the guests they're with. And I want them to leave and I want them to feel really good. Yeah. And like what happened through all the years where I dined out in New York like twice a week with my wife because I wanted to see what was up. It's like it was – you always overdo it and you always leave leave holding your gut, you know. And one of the things I loved about going to Japan is like – Every time I went for an indulgent long meal in, J- mm-hmm. in Japan and ate that food of that culture, I never felt weighed down. I never – I always left – even if it was a three-hour extravaganza of a meal, I was like ready to ta- – like I would leave the restaurant and like would welcome a long walk home or mm-hmm. whatever else. But like too often, you know, you go out to restaurants and you eat kind of – not the highest quality foods and and it's a little bit too you know simple carb heavy cuz it's very those are cheap those are cheap ingredients um and like bad fats and and like not so good and not so fresh other things and like guess what it might have tasted great but you feel like shit yeah so i was like you know how, i want to figure out a way to make it taste great and also make you feel really good yeah and so we really we decided to who's the we well, me and my management team, because it's like restaurants are such a function of teams. I mean, 
the you know the idea was kind of born in my mind, but it's like I had to sell it and pitch it to my team. Yeah, which is like part of the <laughs> art, right? And, and like, you were ten years in at this point. Yeah, How many years, ten yeah. years in. Just separated with my business partner. Roto had launched a year earlier and was really going off the rails. And there was a narrative attached to Brodo around health and wellness. And I was like, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to bring hearth into that world in a meaningful way. And I want this whole, I want everything I do to be wrapped around delivering nourishment and delivering, uh, you know, experiences that make people feel good. And it's everything from the cigar box we put on our table to make people put their phone in it so that they could be present with their dining mate um, to the fact that like, you know, we only, we only get high quality grass fed butter. Now we don't use any commodity butter. We're like really, really particular about sourcing very high quality and very nutrient dense products. Um, and then like, preparing them simply and not getting too fussy about it. And it's like, so that's what we do. Well, and I'm, people are loving it. And, and I love it. I eat dinner there like twice a week. <laughs> well, I remember you were terrified to do this. and Terrified. Re- okay. Oh, my God. And so how did you start to know that it was working? Part of it was because of the success of Brodo, right? So I was like, wow, I guess people aren't afraid. Like, I guess there is a real demand in New York for healthful, simple, light, not complicated things, right? And like, and remember, like Kraft was kind of like that, right? Kraft was like the super pared down version, but it's like everything's timing, you know what I mean? It's all about the timing and where the consumer mindset is. And uh, it's like I remember Michelle Nishan doing Heartbeat. Yeah. And that not last, and he's so wonderful. And that wonderful. not working, right? Yeah. And he attached that narrative to it a little bit, like healthful, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, yeah, 10 years ago, people would be like, give me a fucking break. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want, you know, don't try to tell me I should go out to dinner and be virtuous. Right. <laughs> and like, but now it's like, I think I can convince people that like you can come to hearth and feel decadence and feel like you're splurging and feel like this is like a a luxury and it's delicious and you feel like it's almost like the guilt-free guilty pleasure is how I like to frame it. Screw guilt. I Guilt has no place in my narrative. uh, Good for you. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, Except for the Catholic part of it because I cannot escape that. (laughs) But you know, some people I think like they, they, um, they build that into their lives because it's like it's and they embrace it, which is a good thing. And it's like, if I'm going to go out on Saturday night, like I don't want to go out to the healthy restaurant because like I want to go out on Saturday night and like have three martinis and eat a steak and a big pile of French fries. Um, and that's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. But I will say there is a healthy version of steak and there is a healthy version of French fries. And there's a healthy version, you know, of every, there's a qualitative healthy version of everything that's out there. Yeah. And it's like, you know, so... Well, I've seen both you and my other favorite chef in New York, Missy Robbins. Ah, Missy. <laughs> yeah, who also, you know, went through a change herself and yeah. she decided it was it was such a joy to have her food after she cuz I had gotten to know her when she was at Avoce. Mm-hmm. So I worked upstairs from there and it was and the thing is I always felt like the two of you sort of cooked in the same key just at maybe 100%. different ends of the the keyboard. I think yep. I introduced you to Ed Cochon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, and and uh, it was funny because I remember when I, I told Missy Robbins about how much I love your food. She's like, yeah, I get your deal. <laughs> right. I think you, you know, right. same kind of thing because you both have this very heartfelt, soulful, Italian-backed mm-hmm. kind of food. But she also went through a tremendous, deliberate health shift. Yep. And when she opened up Lilia, it was uh, – I, I said, you know, I I've love always loved – that restaurant. My she's God. so great. She, uh, she – and, and 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 the new place also, Missy, is, Missy, is I, I haven't so, been yet. But. It's a glorious and fantastic. But she had done sort of a test dinner in between that she had, um, like, cooked it as sort of a private dinner. And I started crying mm. because it was sort of all of these – the kind of cooking, the flavor. I'm like, this – it's like this thing that I'd always loved. Went to grad school mm-hmm. <laughs> and, like, pared back and, and just – it was the it was the most out of the least. Yeah, and it was such a it was such a beautiful I mean, thing. You know, I grew up in an Italian household, so of course it resonates with me. But like Italian food, man, it's just like it's got that like wholesome simplicity and deep 
like flavors that just like it just triggers something deep inside your soul for I mean for me and I think for a lot of people which is why like you know I wish Dave Chang was here because he always like <laughs> wants to talk shit about Italian food I love it um, but it's like he's tried it <laughs> yeah and and it's just like it, it it's so simple and it's so clean and it's so so nourishing um and and Missy is so masterful at it Truly. like she is and it's like it's balanced food it's like they love their acid they love their lemon good quality fats like vegetables vegetables like my god and and like yeah i mean there's real magic in what missy does because it's like it's not there's not some big toolbox it's like it's it's really like acid good oil salt and pepper and good ingredient and <laughs> like good vegetables say salt fat acid heat <laughs> yes exactly exactly and it's not you know but to, to nail that right and create the food that she does is not easy. So, and she's a master yeah, at it. Yeah, well, so, so are you. So how did, <laughs> how did we get to this sort of American notion where Italian food is reduced to a big plate of pasta, you know, a, a, a yeah, sauce, a some question. cheese, some... Because you used to play with that because I remember doing the Sundays at Hearth. We did Red Sauce Sundays, yeah. We have pictures on the wall. <laughs> we did a whole, like, campaign behind it. Yeah. And it was fun. But you're right. It's like it's not very reminiscent of the of the cuisines of Italy that I'm aware of. I mean, is it Italian American? Maybe. Yeah, or is this totally, Olive Garden notion? <laughs> yeah, it's totally an Italian American thing. I can't I can't really um, wax poetic on the on the history of it or why mm-hmm. or how, but it's certainly not reminiscent of the Italian food I grew up mm-hmm. with. I mean, my mom is from Lucca in Tuscany, and you know I grew up with a garden, and like Tuscan food is like super seasonal and super simple and very vegetable forward and salads and frittatas and like simple fried rabbit and like things like that, you know, not complicated, but there wasn't, you know, there's fresh tomato sauce in the summer Mm -hmm. with spaghetti, which is like one of my favorite things ever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you and spaghetti. I remember you had gotten some sort of <laughs> apostate extruder that you were nerding yeah. out about. So- Old Josh, our friend Josh Arzerski did oh, a thing on it. Yeah, oh Josh. You know, I stumbled across the YouTube video of Josh the other night and like I had such a moment. Can we talk thinking- about, it for maybe this is too much right now. <laughs> I don't know, but I, 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 I let's just go there. I... I <laughs> uh, for people who do not know the backstory here, Josh Arzerski was... A food writer who is <laughs> so fabulously polarizing, love, hate, nobody's so different, uh, but just a man of extreme appetites and passions yeah. who I had known for years um, before he was a food writer because I knew a woman he was dating. And um, he died very suddenly uh, while we were all at the James Beard Awards in Chicago a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, like, I I think we all sort of found out about it. I was in the press room. Yeah, it was brutal. And uh, I remember you were the person I wanted to find after yeah. that. And we found each other um, at a party afterwards. Mm. And it was such a – screwed with my mind because a couple of my best friends at Batard you know, had, had just won Best New Restaurant. And yep. at the same – like, Josh had had died. And I remember – It was a tough, conflicting oh, God. awards ceremony. Ceremony, right? Oh, now. it was so hard. Jesus. But I remember it you was and I. Really hard. Well, we were standing outside of Big Star. You and I were, yeah. and there was guacamole and chips. I just wanted to find you. Right. And I just remember we kept hugging and saying, "Fuck, fuck, <laughs> fuck," and not yeah, it believing it. And um, and I, I just, you know, I just remember that. But he, he sort of, you know, had this Rabelaisian appetite. He was, <laughs> was amazing, and he was a great champion of your. your he was food. such a champion of mine, and like we did so much stuff together, and like. Yeah. He he helped me so much. Like uh, when I opened NCMA in Midtown, across the street from La Brea I Den. always forgot that. Um, yeah, you know, I like my God. I poured my I poured every iota of my soul into that place, and like Frank Bruni reviewed it, and it wasn't the review I wanted, and I was just like beside myself in all kinds of you know ruminating fucked up narratives over it, and. Uh, I remember like he he was the guy who helped me through that time so much yeah. because he was just like I don't know. I don't remember what he said but he was he was so uh I don't know how to I don't know really how to explain a guy like Josh. He he was so <laughs> smart and so thoughtful but yet had so much levity about him and so much like 
it was like joy, but bitter, but with bitterness. Yeah, I used to. Oh my god, I used a to, joyful bitterness. I don't know. It was I, wild. I used to fight with him in my head all the time. I'd like he would say so we'd be like fighting on Twitter, and then yeah. I'd go to bed and I'd still be fighting with him in my head. And but I think his written word. I think he was one of the best writers that you know in the food space. Uh, I, I read his stuff, and I'm just like, God damn! Like he really gets it, and he's so articulate, mm-hmm. and he has a very unique voice, and. He was he was a beast. Yeah, I was actually weirdly I was reading a, a story of his just yesterday mm. about him talking about like sort of those of us who sneaked in the back door as food writers. Yeah, because I, I sort of feel that way with with me and with 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 Josh with Pete Wells like we all kind of mm-hmm. you know sneaked in Somehow there somehow got in yeah yeah um it, it's it's just you know it's it was sort of like a funny like the early two thousands in mm-hmm. you know finding restaurants. I, I found myself using hearth as a litmus test sometimes um, I because I remember going with a – oh, I remember how I found. Yeah, so uh, there, <laughs> there had been a sandwich uh, that was at a uh, craft bar that I used to go the to. The duck ham and telegio and hen of the yeah, woods. Yeah, and I, and I had gone there for I think lunch one day with some, with some friends and had this sandwich – that was the best sandwich I'd ever had in my life. I could not get enough of it. This was the most amazing thing <laughs> I want to bring that thing back. Well, so I would go, this was just when I was starting out as a food writer, I would go to things that Tom Colicchio was uh, a panelist on mm-hmm. and I would you know, raise my hand, um, excuse me, I have a question about this sandwich that I had. <laughs> like, and I asked it a couple of times. I was nobody. Like I was just getting started in food writing. And right. I finally, I think maybe about the second or, th- or like maybe the third time I asked it, he's like, okay, fine. There is this place uh, that you should uh, go to. Um, I think it was maybe you had introduced a, t- a terroir mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and you can go and get the freaking sandwich there. Like, stop bugging yeah. me about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went there and I realized, like, oh, wait, there's Hearth right. as well. And and uh, taking friends to Hearth, we had sort of our, you know, ladies who dine kind of thing. And we all were so blown away by the meal we had there. So when I started dating my husband. Uh, I remember one of our first dates. I, you know, I, I would never was a person who would like, oh, if you don't like this band or this movie, then whatever. Right. But I needed to know, it was really important to me that he appreciated food and eating the same way that I did. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, and I brought him in there and he got it. That's so cool. He, and so, you know, I can't tell you how many birthdays and like anniversaries. It's a big first date spot, Hearth. Yeah. And uh, I did an event last night, uh, one of these charity dinners that we auctioned off with Alex Guarnicelli. Oh, she's so and, great. And uh, she reminded me last night that uh, her first date with her ex, now ex-husband and father of her mm-hmm. one child was at Hearth. And, and she <laughs> kind of did the same thing. She was like, I love this restaurant and I want to see if he loves it too. Yeah. And well, the thing is also the way that you hire there, the the front of house people, there's something so weird and wonderful and human yeah. about the servers there. I definitely had a few times when I sat at the pass because this, this chef's table kind of thing. And I remember sitting there where it's so like this seat along the kitchen where, you know, open kitchen, you can watch. Yeah. And I stood up and applauded at one point because it was, <laughs> it was like a ballet. It was such a gorgeous thing. It gets pretty wild in there. Yeah. But it's, and then I ended up going to, you know, a million and wine dinners. Mm-hmm. They're sitting at the bar and having gnocchi and hen of the woods. Yeah. And you know, the thing I remember most about you is uh, when Stephen Solomon uh, told me that you wrote something, I think in the early days of Twitter, maybe. Um, oh, about God. wanting to take a bath, say. wanted to take a bath in our chicken liver pate. It specifically was wanting to be <laughs> and embalmed. And I was like, I got to meet this woman well, it was specific- who wants to bathe in my chicken liver well, it pate. Was, <laughs> it was specifically getting embalmed in it and like having my eye sockets filled. <laughs> yes, with it was it, very like, like I, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. The thing is that chicken liver holds up. It, that is some good <laughs> stuff. And it's, uh, is, that, is, is that still there? Do you we still- have, we still have chicken liver on the menu at hearth. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, and, and it's such an amazing thing because so you, you reopened up the restaurant and, and the thing that you did on the menu that I really appreciated was like you put your values right there on the menu and told yeah, people. That and was a big part of it. You were kind of nervous about, is this too didactic yes. or people want to going to be lecture, going to want to be lectured at right. on this. But what was it that gave you the courage to be like, hey, this is just what we're doing now? You know, I try to every everything we do there, I always try to put it through a lens of like trying to frame it in a way where it won't come across as didactic or dogmatic. So, 
we, we kind of went through this exercise with the, with the phone thing. Cause we're like, how are we going to do it? We don't want to give people an option. And it's just like, it gets so complicated so quickly. Like you have to figure out a way where it's just like, it just happens to be there. And if you want it, you're going to take the opportunity. And if you don't, you could just like not have it be in your face or your life. So I was like, you know what, we're going to, I'm going to distill this thing down. I'm going to print it on the back of my menu. And if people want to read it, they can. And if they turn around and they're like, roll their eyes, like, oh my God, like, give me a break. I don't need to read now because I want to eat dinner. Then they don't have to read it. But guess what? We're not going to talk about it table side because <laughs> I can't stand <laughs> our that. Our chef tonight has decided. Yeah, that. <laughs> our chef tonight thought that you should read the back of the menu. Like, there's none of that. Have and you dined with us before? <laughs> have, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's like such a pet peeve of mine. Like, you need to be prepared to answer any questions, but like, you don't say anything unless there's a question. Like, in my opinion. Yeah. At at, at my restaurant, anyway. Um, so. So that's, you know, so that, that helped mitigate any fears I had, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was like, it's just there. I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud to say that we're doing all this stuff. We really do it. And, uh, so that's how I talked myself into that. Um, and the same thing with the, with the boxes for the phones, it's like, there's a box on the table and it says, open me. And when you open it, there's a little two sentence thing that says, you know, if you want to put your phone away and be with your guests, like this box is here for that service and that's it. And it's nice because everybody notices the box mm -hmm. and everybody reads that little thing. And then eight out of 10 times, if nothing else, uh, a conversation ensues about, you know, social connection yeah, and the world we live in with our devices. And like, I think that that's great. I think that's a lovely thing. Yeah. We all need to like acknowledge that this you know it's crazy the, yeah the the telephone thing is crazy i'm trying to get better about that i about am putting too my my phone down and you know and i feel yeah. sort of like obligated to take pictures of the you know i know you know i never it's tweet while i'm in the a, restaurant or anything like that because that's just douchey it, as hell it's <laughs> such a hard uh relationship you know and like uh, this past Saturday morning, I had one of these special moments with my 13-year-old daughter. 13? Yeah, oh Stella, who, who got – we gave her a phone at uh, 12 mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, much consideration about how and what and when. And we finally broke and got her a phone and, you know, my wife put all these, like, things on it that doesn't allow her to, like, be on the phone for seven hours. Right. Um so it was like one of these moments where I had like, you know, it was Saturday morning, no one was around. It was just Stella and I. And I was like, so Stella, like, how's it going? Like, you know, how's it been life with a phone? You know, like, because I find it fascinating for a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. And like, it was really, it was really amazing because like she, she kind of like fell into tears. And mm. because she said, you know, she's on a chat with like eight or nine of her really good friends and like, it's nonstop. She's like, it's nonstop. It's like all day long. They're like going back and forth with all this stupid little but, 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 but. And then when she like, when she pieces out and then she goes back and then tries to read it all. So and she's much. like, it's so much. And she's like, it's like overwhelmed because like she's got her classes and she's got her family and she's got all her things. And then she has her little circle of friends that are on fucking group chat yeah. all day, every second. And she feels compelled, like she doesn't want to miss out. And it's like, it's a lot to handle for a 13 year old girl. Yeah. And I felt, you know, I was like, the first thing I was like, man, thank God. Like first thing I felt was like such empathy for her Yeah. because it was obviously weighing on her and it was so hard to deal with as a 13 year old navigating it's hard through to be a 13 year it's old to, in any era i know in it's any horrible. era and imagine layering this on and like I can't. so first i had a massive amount of empathy for what she's going through and then i was like and then i said to myself thank god i didn't have to deal <laughs> with that shit because it was hard enough oh god it sucks um so you know whatever i i think that you know there's going to be a reckoning i think like it's starting to happen a little bit yeah. already um and we're all going to have to figure out how to deal with it because it's not normal. How to be people at each other. How to be people, yeah. And and I know that this goes into uh, you know, online is so tough, and I know especially for restaurateurs and chefs because there's the immediate feedback on say Yelp or oh fuck everything. Do you do you look at that? You know, I have looked at it less lately, but uh, 
you know, um, during the years that I was really looking at it, I I really tried my best to frame it in a positive way because I think there's there's value in meta analysis, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's value in going on Open Table and seeing what the general consensus is on 40,000 reviews. Like yep. <laughs> that's, that's meaningful, right? Yeah, and, if you see and the same thing over and over. Exactly. So, you you know, I read it. I assess if there's an action that needs to be taken or if I think that this is just a miserable, awful person <laughs> yeah. um, because there's a lot of miserable, awful people that aren't really adding value with their criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, so – if there's a nugget of value, like I, I'm, I'm certainly in a place where I can uh, not take things personally, where I can kind of, uh, I like to think most of the time, control my thinking around <laughs> stuff. Um, so I, I think there's value in it. I'm not, I'm not like it should all be thrown in the garbage because I think you know, having access to the voice of many. Um, is a good thing, yeah. not a bad thing. Yeah, I think so long as you know to not pick the scab too much. Yeah, exactly. It's so which easy. is which is a learning curve, man. It's really, oh. really hard. I say this as a yeah. You've seen my bloody thumb before. Oh my god! It's, it's been a hamburger recently. Post, post next Iron Chef, I went down the fucking road of reading some of the shit, oh. and it was like you know. It, that was hard. And you, I was not in a good place at that time in my life, and like. It was really difficult to read all this, all this like vitriol and negativity towards like the way in which I was portrayed in the editing room. You know, it was like, oh my god, this is weird. Have you done uh, <laughs> much like TV? This would is you hard. would you ever do reality TV again or competition TV? Um, no, I would. I, I don't think I would ever do. I don't think I would ever compete. Yeah. Um. I you know I love I love judging. I think it's really fun, and I think I I have uh, you know valuable insights to lend to that arena of judging those sorts of competitions because I've been in them and I've also been a chef for twenty thirty years. Wow! Um, <laughs> so you know I feel like I, I really enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and man, if I was a better writer, I would try to embrace that because like um, I just I suck at writing. Your cookbooks are great, though. Well, thank you, Kathy Young and Tammy Walker. <laughs> you know, I, I think I don't know if people know, but a lot of chefs like they they've got help like translating translating chef to human is a little it's bit amazing. It's amazing. You know that process is kind of fun because basically it's like I would just go. You know, I could I could talk my ass off, right? So I would just go on these rants, <laughs> and then they would be there, like, okay, slow down, and like they'd be trying to type it away, and like. And they would capture my voice. So it's kind of, yeah. it's, you know, the whole ghostwriting thing is a little weird, right? I mean, it's absolutely my words and my thoughts right. uh, and my voice. I just didn't write it. Yeah. No, it, it feels very you, but you also were straight up about giving credit to. You oh, know, the, hundred, the on the cover. Too. No yeah. doubt. <laughs> and that's such a good thing. And yeah. So I, mean, I, it's such a funny thing because uh, it, you were a person who I've always thought of as a chef's chef. Like for years, I would, you know, have conversations with chefs and, they, they, you know, they ask me who your favorite chefs are and, you know, say you and, and Missy. And, and the thing is like, or they would bring you up first. And it was, you've always been a chef who other chefs have really admired. But for a long time, you didn't get that splashy, critical, like whatever it was. I always thought like, Damn it! You, I felt like you were under the radar mm-hmm. for a long time in a really weird way. I remember uh, it was my birthday, I think, and, and Douglas and I were going to Hearth, and I'm running into a friend who was a fairly like snarky food writer, and he's like, "Where are you going? Well, like Hearth?" And he's like, "People go there." I'm like, "Fuck you!" Yes, <laughs> and that he eventually ended up going, and really was like, "Oh, okay, I get it." Um, <laughs> so I remember for years That's and this town, though, man, years and obsessed. years, and you, so you were nominated for uh, Best Chef New York, James Beard Award, and, mm-hmm. uh, and like years in a row. And I remember yeah. there was uh, one particular year, you were just like, screw it, I'm not going to go. Mm-hmm. Always the bridesmaid kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, I don't know if I told you, or maybe I did, that I actually um, had gotten the winners earlier. So 
I knew that oh, you God. had one, but I couldn't tell you. Right. And uh, I, I believe I gave you a beta blocker before the ceremony, <laughs> or else you weren't going to go. Because <laughs> I wanted True you to. Because I wanted you to. Ha- I, I remember you came, maybe came to town at the last second yeah, or something. I did. And I think also maybe Missy came when she the year she won. She came to town at the last yeah. second. And and because did you feel you like know, just always the bridesmaid? How did that feel? You know, it's weird. Like that that entire James. You know, this industry, those awards, um, as as an independent guy with one independent restaurant and like everybody at the restaurants like got to work because we're small and like we don't have layers and layers of resources or back office. It's, it's, it, it's always been very weird for me to go to these awards because it's like, you know, it's like my wife – is with my kids and is a school teacher. So I'm not going to bring my wife. I could barely get anybody out of the restaurant to come with me because, you know, and it's like, it's not like, you know, I don't know. You look around and it's like, there's the, there's the entourage of union square and the entourage of Bastianich and the entourage of, you know, with all their big head chef guys and like their whole, the whole crew. And it's like, I've always been very self-conscious because like, I don't have an entourage. And you I don't have like, back office. I'll be so your entourage. Like, so it's it's kind of you know <laughs> yeah. it's awkward, and I'm self conscious, and it's like, great, I got I'm gonna go to the fucking beard awards like by myself, and hopefully find somebody to sit with, um, because I don't have an entourage or like a big restaurant group. Um, but look, I always find friends, and I, the thing I love about this industry is like, it's such a great. I'm so. I'm so proud to be a part of this industry because there's so many cool, wonderful people. And like, and every time, every time I ended up getting over the hump of like getting my ass there Mm -hmm. uh, and through the rumination of getting my ass there, it's always like such a pleasant surprise. And I'm always like so happy because I run into like you (laughs) and others and it's just like, it always feels right and good. And so. you won. Yeah. What year was that? that uh, was... 17. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Uh, right after Mark Ladner mm-hmm. and right before uh, Missy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I call him. I do call him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. It, I, I, I can't tell you how happy that night was. Oh, uh, man. Me see, too. Seeing you get this recognition was super emotional. I, I think probably for a lot of us who have have seen what you've been doing this whole time, mm. I went to your, you did an amazing dinner for your 10 year anniversary. Yeah. And that was ambitious because it was 10 courses each cooked by a different person. Can we go through the lineup of who was cooking that night? And it was Oof. for charity, by the way. This was an amazing thing because I remember. Yeah. Tom was there. Mm-hmm. Dave Chang was there. Hugh Damon At- Wise was there. Hugh Atchison, or I think he was oh, in busing. Or no, something. that was different. Oh, so wait, I did. So there was there was two things I did at right. ten years. Okay. I did a guest chef from outside oh, of right, the city right, thing. Right. That was a different thing. And right. like I had different people come throughout a span of three months. So like right. Sean Brock came and we did a fried chicken thing. <laughs> And Hugh Ackeson came and he did his thing. You know what? I feel like maybe I'm wrong on this, but I feel like he slid into the restaurant that night just to be there on the on the night when you had all the like all those. Yeah. Chefs. So then and then it culminated in yeah. a ten course, ten chef dinner with all my local guys that I grew up with. So yeah. like Benno was there and da- and Damon Wise and Dave Chang and Octar and Ed Carew and Cisha Ortuzar and like all of my real close knit group of people that I kind of came up in the industry with. Yeah. And we all did a course and we were all in the kitchen at the same time. And that was like a spectacular night. It was such a magical night. I remember it really feeling was. so lucky to be there. And we were put at random tables. So Douglas and I were put at a table with like Jim Nelson. And, yes, and, and GQ. And his, yeah, and, and his partner. And it was- He's it, awesome. Yeah, and then all the money went to charity. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a, a yeah. really lovely, beautiful thing. Yeah. So you've got now the hardware. <laughs> you've, yeah. You've got the thing. And you were saying about how you- 
you know, you have the one place and you have, you know, that recognition now. So we were talking beforehand a little bit about there are all these different metrics for what success and excellence look mm. like. And I've been having this conversation with more and more people. Um, Ashley Christensen gave a speech and wrote an incredible essay about she opened too many places too quickly and mm -hmm. it really burned her out. And she wanted to redefine what success looks like. It, whether that's opening a second restaurant or just really doubling down on what you're doing. Yeah. So how did, did the recognition change what you look at as success? What is that for you? And how does it differ from how it was when you were working at Gramercy, mm -hmm. when you were working at, at other places? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I think, you know, getting an award such late, so late in my career was actually a, a blessing. Can you say how old you were when you won it, just so the folks uh, here... <laughs> 49. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 48 or 49. I think that's important for people to hear. Yeah, exactly. Like, my God, I was at it for a long time. And like, you know, look, it's like, had it happened when I was 26, like I'd probably be having a much different narrative than today. So, you know, I don't want to say, um, it wasn't incredibly meaningful and it didn't feel like amazing. And I'm so proud of that and getting recognized. Um, however, I was also like at an age and at a place in my brain where it was like this, this recognition of like, you know, it was just another day, you know, <laughs> because like two days later, guess what? Like I went to work at hearth and I was back at it. I you text, know what I mean? I, you know, I texted you to see how you were holding up and you're yeah. like, well, you know, <laughs> guess what? Yeah. yeah. There you... Not much has changed. Like there's the, there's the lead in. Like there's the nomination thing and then there's the small list and then, you know, and then it's like, and sure there was, you know, there were opportunities that came from it that I'm very grateful to have gotten. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I feel like one of the things about the crazy world we live in with so much, uh, information is that, um, it's also fleeting, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I grew up in a time, you know, when I started at Gramercy Tavern, it's like. My God, if you got a feature story in Food and Wine magazine, it was like fucking life changing, right? Like there were these gatekeepers that mm -hmm. had the ability to like, it was like a massive shift in your life if certain things happened or certain people said the right thing. And like with every passing year, mm -hmm. that's becoming less and less the yeah. case, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, it's not to say that James Beard Awards aren't impactful. They are, and they feel great, and I'm super f grateful to get it. However, it was like, it was fleeting. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fleeting. Um, it's always nice to get reminded. Yeah. It's always nice to come and do podcasts like this and like have, it's like a notch in my belt that is like <laughs> never going to go away. Yeah. And it's really nice to have that notch. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's not life changing, I think, the way it was maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what does then success like on a daily basis? What does that look like for you? What does a good day look like for oh, you? Oh, man. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly trying to just stay in a motivated, positive space because it's very, um, you know, when you're running businesses and you're managing people and you're in a, you know, Hundred year old building in the East Village that a car crashes into. That a car crashes into. <laughs> you, were you there that night? I no. Soon after that, <laughs> oh, that yeah. cars crash into uh, exactly. Because um. <laughs> it's it's on a corner, and seriously, it's a just car ran into the corner of the building. <laughs> like, Shit like that happens. You know, this old tenement building. It's like, and like we're fifteen. We celebrated fifteen years this year. Oh God, that's and it's amazing. Just like, and and New York years, that's like one hundred and fifty. Yeah, fifteen years is a well, big deal. By the way, we're talking. Uh, so I was in a meeting yesterday and we're trying to figure out what this is going to look like, but we're talking about doing it best old chefs, yeah. you know, because we have best new chefs and like 100%. Re really giving it to the people who have been sticking it out. Cause I think of like, I have always thought Gunter that would be Seeger. a great idea. Oh, yeah. I well, know. It's like, I think we need to celebrate the guys that are and girls. And <laughs> girls. I meant that as both, uh, that are, that have been around and doing mm -hmm. it, that need a little bit of attention and love. Cause we are so, we are so obsessed, especially in New York City with new and noteworthy. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's the land of 20,000 restaurants. And like, you don't have to go to the same place twice ever. So it yeah. is very challenging to 
to hit those milestones of like five and 10 and 15 years. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I have hearth and I have Zadie's down the street, which is a tiny little oyster bar. And we are have hearth on the High Line this year oh, for six months. Okay, that's uh, so cool. And then there's four, you know, there's four, I have four broth shops now. And it's like, guess what? Like there's a lot of people and that's a lot of uh, equipment that breaks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and you're, and, and it's just, it's challenging to get through the day and, and kind of put out all the fires in a, in a productive, positive way without going down negative narratives. Right. It's mm-hmm. like, it's very, it's hard and, I, and I'm also, you know, I'm also not one of these like frame everything as positive because oh. it's always so great. It, like it's not there has to be, around, yeah. it has to be like, I am not good at faking shit. Like I'm just not like, I'm an authentic, genuine person. So I have to like try to navigate through those challenges um, in the way I only know how, which is a real authentic way, right? So it's just like, it's, you know, whatever. We all we all know, like yeah. it's challenging. God, brains are tough. Brains are tough. Brains are like, I would, I've been obsessed with like trying to figure out how to control, you know, I love the notion of like, I wanna be a fly on the wall of my own brain, you yeah. know? I think there's real power in being a fly on the wall and being like, you know, yeah, like I'm just not going to do that. (laughs) Like you kind of talk, you know, some people would say that's kind of psychotic, but but it's like, I I literally like talk to myself a lot in my brain. Yeah. I I get (laughs) that. Is that that weird? (laughs) No. Oh my God. No. I think everybody's brain is different. I refer to mine as a rotten, as a rotten pile of meat a lot of the time. Yeah, exactly. I I mean, I I will tell you, writing a memoir about your mental health is a really good way to take an outside look at your own mental processes. I'll tell you the thing I did for myself is I went on medication for ADHD Mm. and that helped me like my brain better. Oh, good for you. Really? Yeah. It like, it physically hurt. Less nice. <laughs> like my, this 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 piece of meat in my in my head did. Um, I find not eating helps me. So do you do like intermittent fasting? I do. Or, okay. How did you learn how to do that? I'm so fascinated. With Look, I've been I've been like obsessed in reading about health and nutrition for like a decade now. So. And you're a super yoga dude. No, I was well, I you, did for okay. like there was like a there's like four year period of time over the last decade where I was really into it. But I'm not I'm not doing yoga much. I do I do exercise like four or five times a week, um, but not yoga. It's too goddamn time consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just a lame excuse too, but it, it is hard to like get there. You know, it's, it's a yeah. long process. It's much easier for me to like run to the Y on 12th street and get like a 45 minute workout. Then. Yeah. Um, so anyway, where were we? What did you ask? Brains. Brains. <laughs> yeah, brains, How good days. Help? Oh, we were talking about, yeah, what... So I find not eating yeah. helps me um, because one, I have a conversation with myself about discipline around not eating and you constantly have to like be like, oh, wow, like I'm hungry now or wow, look at that thing. I want it and I'm going to literally not do it. Oftentimes I lose that battle. I just did right before I came over here. I didn't want to eat, but the, our pastry chef was like, I just made a really great uh, – <laughs> coffee cake for, you know, this weekend's brunch. Like, do you want to oh. try a piece? And I was like, oh, my God, Come on. coffee cake. <laughs> coffee cake is with so... With crumble. How do you... Like, no, Jesus no one can Christ. resist that. Like, who can resist that? <laughs> no. I mean... So it's like, that's, you know, one of the challenges, blessings and the curse of being a chef. My God. <laughs> um, so I lost that battle. I wasn't able to talk myself out of trying the coffee cake. Um, I bet it was great, Which though. is fine. Like, look, I don't... I don't like torture myself over it. I just, I find it fun and challenging to like control my, uh, you know, my instinctual eating. Cause like as a chef being in the, around food all the time, mm-hmm. it's like, it just becomes like, y- you just do it. Like you don't even know you're doing it. It's like there's food and salty meat and like a beautiful thing and coffee cake. And like, there's always so much shit around to like shove in your mouth. Yeah, It becomes like, not a conscious thing. Right. So it's like trying to shift into like making sure that when I grab something and put it in my mouth, it's actually a thoughtful conscious thing is a, is a fun exercise that I try to do. Yeah. It's like a workout for your brain. It's a workout for your brain. Yeah. And because this is a, you know, podcast for food and wine pro, and I know people 
want to know. You've done a thing that I think everybody thinks like, what is that spinoff product I can have? What is what is that other kind of thing? And you did that with Brodo. Mm. How did you... Uh, because with restaurants, you have to think about marketing and stuff, but no, not packaging yeah. as much. So how did you decide this is this is a thing? I'm going to go all in. Yeah. I'm going to have this as a, a product. I see it being sold by – it's like Fresh Direct has it. It's, yeah. in, it's in a whole bunch of different places. Yeah, we're in a bunch of Whole Foods now. We're in 200 yeah. stores. Oh, my God. We have a distribution company. And this is really crazy I mean, delicious. 200 stores is very, very small in the world of packaged goods, by the way. Like when I'm in – you know. I've seen my friends. I say 200 stores to people and they're like, oh my God. And it's like, you know what? Say, oh my God, when I say I'm in 7,000 stores. Well, I've seen the rollout of Big Gay Ice Cream. And yeah. How, like, it, and well, hello, the, Nestle. It's like, it's a distribution game. It's like. I didn't. Oh, I didn't realize that that was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. their their package good was acquired by Nestle. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. But it's still, I know from being like, you know, friends with them that like each new place that it's in, they're like, oh my God. This is incredible yeah. to have somebody, you know, they ask people on Facebook, could you, if you see it in your your freezer, could you, at whatever store it is, mm-hmm. take a snapshot because it matters. It's yeah. really cool. Do people yeah. send you Brodo pictures? They do. It's yeah. really fun. Like I saw it at Whole Foods. It's like so exciting. Yeah. So, I mean, um, would you think that this is like it, for people, because, you know, re- restaurants have such tight margins and stuff. Ugh. Should people consider doing a spinoff product? Um. I mean, look, I I kind of thought it was going to be – I always had stars in my eyes around the prospect of creating that product Mm -hmm. because, like, I told myself a story that was absolutely fucking not true, (laughs) and I believed it. (laughs) Well, with a certain amount of delusion. The the untrue story was – wouldn't it be great to create a package good because you could just make it at, like, large batches and especially broth. I was like, oh, my God, this would be so easy. I could make a huge batch of broth and I could put it into containers and then sell it without any of the work of, like, running a restaurant every day. (laughs) And, like, compared to, like, you know, what restaurants do on a daily basis is absolutely fucking insane. Oh, demented. Nobody should go into the business. You know (laughs) that. It's, like, it is a psychotic pursuit, especially if it's, like, if you're trying to make it a business. Um, And so everything else seems easier. So it's like I had this dream of like what it would mean to create a packaged good and how easy that would be. But it's like, guess what? Like I didn't know anything about what it meant to create a packaged good and what it meant to get distribution and to commercialize and the marketing behind it and all the loops and all the people who had their hands out between the making and to the shelf and like, it is a beast and it's just a different kind of beast. You know, it's just, it's just as big of a beast as a restaurant. It's just a different beast. So I've been, you know, we've been learning, uh, we've been learning a lot and we've been doing our best to like, you know, bring a, a traditionally made wholesome broth to market. And I think we're doing it, um, slow and steady, uh, which I believe is always the best way to build something. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't discourage anybody to do it, but I would say do your research and go out there with your eyes wide open because it certainly ain't any easier than, you know, the craziness of, of a restaurant. Yeah. What would you tell 20 years ago, Marco? Grab that kid by the shoulders. <sighs> God damn. You know, the pursuit of perfection is such a, it's such a bad path. You know, like you have to, you have to frame it, uh, um, it's just too hard on yourself. It's too hard on the people around you. Um, and there is no such thing and it's often impossible to like balance some ambitious, crazy pursuit of perfection and all the other things that you should do for yourself and your well being. It's really hard to do both. So I would say perfection, you know, I would be like, stop trying to fucking control everything and make everything perfect because it's a losing, you're never going to win that game. Yeah. You know, what was that? What was that uh, three star Michelin chef guy who wrote the book and he ended up shooting himself in the head? Bernard Vollier? Was that him? Bernard. uh, Vollier? Is is, is that him? No, I would recognize the name. But anyway, you know the guy I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, like old school French yeah. three star. He wrote a book and then like shortly after like he ended up killing himself. Um, but like 
I read that book and it resonated with me because I was like, I kind of like could relate because like I was always like, I was always like the micromanaging maniacal needs to be perfect guy. And like I would see every fucking thing Mm -hmm. and like, and then I would freak out and then I'd be hard on myself because I didn't really act appropriately and I knew it. And it was like this horrible, vicious cycle of like always feeling like shit. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. like you didn't you didn't get the perfection you wanted. Then you didn't act the way you know you should. And then you were down in yourself for reacting the wrong way. And like it was this never ending cycle of not fulfill of of non fulfillment and no there's satisfaction no, and joy. There's no winner there. There's no winner. It was like the fucking worst. So if I can go back twenty years I would be like, don't you get it, you dumb asshole? <laughs> Nobody wins in this scenario where you're trying to push so hard to find perfection every day. Like, nobody wins. Your family doesn't win. The people you work for don't win. You certainly don't win. And the consumer doesn't win. Uh, you know, like early days at Hearth when we had the open kitchen and I would go on these like maniacal tirades because things weren't perfect. Uh, you know, like people walked out of the side dining room because they were like, Mm-hmm. I don't want to be here. I don't want to support the asshole you are right now. And like they would leave and I, and I would feel like shit. I had this conversation with, with David Chang on this, this podcast where he was saying it really resonated with him when uh, he read somewhere that the, you know, the food had been technically perfect, all these things, but him yelling at a, a sous chef was, uh, made the diner uncomfortable and ruined, yeah. it colored the whole experience. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, but you, you, you made a change and this is oh, a really thank God. lovely. It was too hard. Yeah, you seem so much more happier in your skin now and that's such I a. So, I so am. That's. It's, it's just part of growing up too, I think, you know, yeah. I think it comes with age. You know, I used to sort of fear getting older and stuff, and now I'm just like... I kind of love it. Yeah. I like. I sort of think like somebody gets upset, like, it's their problem. It's like, I love it because I've learned so many lessons, and like, God, I... (laughs) It's funny because like I get... I put the the old man mentor hat on with some of my... (laughs) Some of the people that work for me that I like, I genuinely, you know, love like family, and it's just like, I'm so glad I'm in a place where I could like try to... You know, you asked me what I would say to myself 20 years ago. Well, you got this I'm not saying it. Yeah, I'm not saying it to me, but I'm saying it to the people that are working at Hearth. And like, that feels really good. That's Because I'm like, let me save you. Let me save you some of the fucking pain (laughs) that I went through (laughs) and some of the learnings I had. And it's like, and you know, I feel like I'm in a good position to like uh, say things to them that are going to resonate because like I've built, I've built credibility Mm -hmm. and I've built trust, right? So I'm in a pretty powerful position to like have real influence on these guys uh, and girls and girls. Sorry, <laughs> I mean I mean that as the whole. Uh, <laughs> it's like when you say "Hey guys," I don't really mean I, guys. I go but with you y'all. Get it. You get it. Hey all. Um, so yeah, it's fun. I I love doing that. Do you, do you ever yell at them to protect their knees, stand a different way? Because, man. Protect their knees, you said? Yeah, or just like their bodies. Like, bodies yeah, hurt. it's hard. <laughs> Long days are hard. Um, but, you know, it is it is at odds with the notion of, like, the old school notion of discipline and work ethic, mm-hmm. right? And it's like we've, we've been uh, discussing and working very hard at trying to just, like, most of the chefs that come on here, they say the same thing, but like trying to change the culture within our four walls, you know? And it's like, I don't want you to work nine days straight and I don't want you to work two doubles. Like I want you to work like, you know, five days a week, 50 to 60 hours. And I want you to work hard while you're here, but it shouldn't be crazy. And it's like, and if it becomes overwhelming and crazy, then like, let's, there are things you could do, you know? It's like, change the menu, like reduce the menu. Like we do it to ourselves a lot of the oh, time. And, so you know, self-inflicted. Yeah. <laughs> like George Mendez was mentioning, he's like, you know, we create these and, and, you know, Andrew Carmelini used to be known on the street, the notorious guy who would like, he would just fuck with cooks and like give them extra dishes. Like at three 30, when you're oh, opening geez. at six, they'd, he'd be like, here you go. Like new dish, you need this, 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 and this. And it was like this cool, like kind of hazing, hazing kind of thing, right? Like make it harder, like, you know, 
that that's what builds you know toughness and make it harder make it harder be resilient and it's just like um i'm the opposite i'm like let's figure out a way to create delicious nourishing food that we can actually execute every day and and not feel overburdened by the work of executing what we do every day so that everybody can kind of come in here and like have a joyful existence and a joyful job and be proud and like all those wonderful things that like we should all have in our lives. So long as you keep the gnocchi on there. Yeah, we make <laughs> the gnocchi every day. It's like a meditative act. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. Yay. So what is, and this is saying it out to the universe, mm. so the universe can help you with this. I really believe <laughs> okay. in saying things out loud. What is, what is the thing you want for yourself? What is the selfish thing? Uh, um, I wish I could remember the exact quote and who said it because uh, my daughter just wrote it down and my wife framed it, but it was something to the effect of like, success is measured by the amount of things you don't need to worry about <gasps> or wow. something like that. Oh. And uh, I absolutely love that because it's like the more the more things you're able to let go of and not like have worry over, uh, that's success for me, right? So I, I just I just want like a semblance of like levity and joy in my life. Um and like, and I, and I pursue it like, and I, and I try to balance it with being ambitious. Cause like, I love the, I love the hustle of like trying to achieve things. And like, I'm so obsessed with Brodo and trying to grow Brodo. And like, I really, I'm thinking very big and I'm being very ambitious. And like, I don't see any reason in the world why there can't be a Brodo shop for every like 30 Starbucks in the world. Mm -hmm. I really don't because it's like, it's it's got coffee beat in spades, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd um, rather if you can if you could caffeinate this. this yeah, really... well, guess what? We can, <laughs> and we do with maca and guarana. So I'm here for natural it. <laughs> caffeinated items. Um, so, you know, I love. Uh, that's how I challenge myself today. It's like I want to do both, and I challenge myself to figure out ways to do both. Yeah, to like enjoy my family and enjoy the things that you can be joyful over. And at the same time, like, be ambitious and be a hustler. And uh, I'm trying to do both. Yeah. I think that's I'm is... learning a little bit as we go. It's all, it's all a work in progress. It's all a work in progress. So what is your comfort food? Um, oh, my God. The macaroni with uh, ragu at hearth with Oof. a big dollop of ice cold uh, ricotta on it. God, that sounds like heaven. I mean, it is so... I literally work so hard at not eating a trough of that every <laughs> goddamn day because it's like it's just you know we we you know we mill the flour make the pasta we have great pork we make this ragu and it's so simple and really good reggiano parmesan and an ice cold dollop of ricotta on top and it is just like ridiculous <laughs> i really <laughs> Oh my god! I want to eat that right now. I do too. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so that, there, but th let me tell you though, there's many comfort foods. Like I, I, you know, I'm like I'm like millimeters away from like having an eating disorder because I just love food so much, and I don't need to be hungry to eat it, and it's a problem. Your your gnocchi is such a so I know I keep coming back to that, but that and the hen of the woods. I'm trying to think all the the uh, things I make out of your your book. Also, um, that's so cool. You use that book. The sformato, yeah, like is a is a beautiful beautiful thing. Yeah. There's a warm vegetable salad oh, that that's I'm my favorite. absolutely obsessed with. I got I want people to buy this book because it's it's got such a simple like dressing uh, yeah. to to this and it's salt just, to taste is I I'm so proud of that book. It's such a and it, and it really is one of those things that it, it's just like in my kitchen constantly. So what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Oh my God. I went to, uh, I went to Rome over the holidays mm. and I ate a sandwich from a sandwich stall in the Testaccio market. And it was just my wife and I who left the kids behind. And, uh, Kat, when I tell you, like, I almost started to cry. <laughs> I swear to God. I Und swear. What is in the sandwich? I swear. I literally... I literally like stopped in my tracks and like had like an incredibly like rush of emotion that 
almost brought me to like literal tears. You mean like that duck prosciutto and have a sandwich <laughs> that I had that I stopped? I mean, it was like fucking, about? I, I don't respond, you know, like I love food and I'm a very emotional guy. But I don't typically have that kind of response to food. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was like a culmination of like being in Rome and being in this market and like everything worked. Um, but oh my God, this sandwich literally brought me to tears. Oh my God. So wait, what was on it? Was, uh, it was like little cubes of veal mm -hmm. that were sauteed with sofrito and pancetta and white wine and a lot of like, you know, Roman, you know, the rosemaries and sage. Like, so it was like this... This little warm veal stew mm. that was like so tasty with pork fat and all that stuff. Um, and it was like s held hot and they scooped it into like the perfect ciabatta type bread that like it ate the way like a soft hamburger bun eats because like it didn't, you know, you broke right through it easily, but it still had a crust. Um, and there was a uh, chick wilted chicories on top that were warm too. Mm. And then a big pile of Pecorino Romano that melted on top of that. And it was just, it was like veal stew, very bitter greens, a ton of Pecorino Romano on the perfect piece of bread at the perfect ratios. And it was, it made my brain explode. I am buying a ticket to oh my Rome God. Right now. Like that I literally was like. I'm going to go back and close the Brodo window and do a hot sandwich <laughs> shop out of the Brodo window because it was just like, it was, it was flipping insane. Oh my God. So oh, there nice. you go. Wow. <laughs> that was a journey. <laughs> what is the last meal that somebody made for you in their home? Mm. You know, it was my home, but over Easter, my aunt who I love mm. so much, uh, came, um, because we wanted to, you know, uh, there's some things we make for Easter, traditional foods that we make for Easter that um, I haven't really documented. And I hadn't seen my aunt in a while, so I invited her over to do all the Easter things. And uh, and so I cooked with her. Oh, wow. And and Stella was there, and she kind of documented the whole thing. And we got recipes down, and my cousin Sylvie was there, and like, we made like, you know, the Galantine and like all the little Easter bread things. And, uh, it was amazing. Oh, that's so lovely. It was so lovely. Oh, you have a bunch of Easter in, in cookbooks. Yeah. A uh, bunch of what? Um, Easter recipes. I feel like. Well, we call the, the hearth broth. Oh, Easter broth. Easter broth. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I which made that. has now at Brodo, we call it hearth broth. Ah, oh, yeah. Cause I've made your Easter broth before. It's it amazing. It's phenomenal to have. Yeah. So what living musician would you want to cook for and what would you cook for them? Oh, Jesus. Uh, I don't know. Like I'm an old school guy. Like things like Neil Young come to mind or like oh, wow. some living member of Led Zeppelin or something. Like John – it would be John Bonham. He's got to be living and John Bonham is dead. But like <laughs> John Bonham was such a – I don't know why I idolized this man. But like – You and millions of others. <laughs> I loved his music and I loved everything about him. And it would be him if he was alive, but he's not. So I'm going to say like probably Neil Young or Jimmy Page or something what like that. What would you make for them? Um, I would probably make like a rabbit stew, you know, like I love mm. uh, classic Tuscan style rabbit stew with olives and like a good sofrito um, is one of my favorite foods to like make, to feed people and to eat myself. So. Please say there'd be a side of ribolita with this. Yeah, sure. We'll start with ribolita and a big pile of polenta too. Oh my gosh. And let's say you have five minutes for self-care. Five uninterrupted minutes. Phone's not going to happen. That's Nobody's... not very long. I know. So if what you do get, you do? Will you give me 20 minutes? No, you get five. Fuck. <laughs> um, I would probably just like, I would probably just breathe and meditate. You know, because five minutes is not a lot. But if you gave me more, I would do. I'm so psychotically into hot sauna lately. Where do you go? To the Turkish baths, on uh, right around the corner from Hearth. That hot room is so goddamn hot, and it is like to push your brain and your body to the limit of heat, and then dive into a ice cold bath and push your brain and body to limits of cold, and to go back and forth is like. I can't even recommend it enough to people. It's life changing. Okay, I'm giving you 15 more minutes. Yeah, <laughs> so you, get your 20 you really, minutes. I really highly recommend it. It's so, and it's and it's proven to be really, really good for you. It builds resilience. 
Um, and like, it's just, it's very detoxifying and you sweat like crazy. And there's a lot of research that's like, it's as good as I like to call it. It's like the lazy man's version of exercise <laughs> because like you go in there and after like minute 10, 11, 12, your heart starts racing and you start sweating profusely. And it's like, I just had to sit there. That's <laughs> I didn't have to run a marathon. Without a, without a phone. <laughs> it's like the no. lazy man's exercise. Oh, my God. Yeah, I no love, phone. Yeah. You leave the phone in the locker and you go and sit there and then like you go to the ice bath and you do it back and forth. And it is it is really such a great thing to do for yourself. Go and sit in a pool of Brodo. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh my gosh! And so that, I think we're, we've got to wrap it up now. It, awesome. I, thank you so much, Short. My guest pleasure. Today, this was Marco this Crenor. was great. Please, thank you. Go and get some Brodo for yourself. You're going to be really happy that you <laughs> yes. did. Um, Brodo.com. And and go to Hearth and. And uh, so you've got Salt to Taste and the other book. I always blank on the title. A Good Food Day. A Good Food Day. And there's a Brodo Broth book too. Oh, get all those things into your life. Make make broth at home. And you will realize why this man has so long uh, held this place of tremendous esteem for me as a You're sweet. as a human and as a chef. You're so I just nice. get to n- get to know Marco, and thank you to uh, to our producers Jennifer Martnick and Alicia Cabral. And I never, I always forget to thank the camera people. Thank you, lovely camera people. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thumbs up because they, they they're just so fantastic and patient and all the good things. Thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. Did you know he wrote the theme song, My Lovely Husband? I did not. He did. That's awesome. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review or rate us, those stars, those comments, all that stuff really, really matters and uh, people can find us and then we get to keep doing this. If there is something you would like for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and at Food and Wine's YouTube. Page. Thanks for listening. Take good care of yourself till the next time and drink some Brodo.